Welcome to Zach and Ben's BS Podcast. Uh, I'm Ben, and uh, we have Zach and also our friend Jason, who has come up with some prompts for us to debate in our usual fashion. Um, now, due to the fact that everything is quarantined due to the coronavirus, we have had to make absolutely no changes whatsoever because we're just broadcasting from our apartments. Like, you thought we had a studio? What's wrong with you? Uh, <laughs> yes. We don't, we, 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 we don't actually have money. We're fucking poor. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, uh, ben, why don't you explain kind of, uh, kind of like how, how the uh, process works? Okay, so yeah, we'll be uh, debating a number of topics. Uh, could be any categories related to pop culture, society, current events, politics, uh, whatever. I, I don't know what Jason has prepared for us because uh, he has a series of prompts prepared, but Zach and I don't know what they are ahead of time, so we'll, we, we will be responding in real time, uh, giving some arguments and debating back and forth, and then Jason will judge based on uh, our arguments who has uh, made the better case for their point um, and yeah try and have some fun doing that <laughs> all right jason what have you got we are ready for number one okay so uh would you like to choose from uh different categories or would you like me just to choose a good one to start Tell us the categories, and then we'll choose a category. Okay. So, uh, the categories have different numbers, so they're, they're, it's not like they have, all of them have three. Um, but uh, one of the categories is U.S. politics. Uh, there's also the internet, U.S. history, music and movies, and society. We should probably start with music and movies. Then what do you think, music and movies? Yeah, that sounds good to me. All right, Jason, what have you got for music and movies? Okay. What is the best piece of movie dialogue? So the it best doesn't piece have to be dialogue. The, the, the opening sequence of Reservoir Dogs when Mr. Pitt, or when Mr. Brown is explaining what Like a Virgin is about. Okay, I like it. Um. Because we're, we're talking about something more than just like one quote, right? Yeah, okay. Okay, well, you know... Or, or, or at least it, does, it doesn't have to be a small quote. If, if there's one line that is super iconic, you can use that. But if there's a monologue or uh, an exchange between two characters, something that's less than the whole movie, but is... It, 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 it's contained, but it's not necessarily just one line. Okay. Um, let's see. Well, I've... Um, let's see, I know there's a bunch of good examples, but I might as well pick something from a movie that I uh, know well enough to argue well. Um, so I'll, I'll go the the scene in the diner in Groundhog Day when uh, Bill Murray's character is trying to convince Andy McDowell's character that he is living the same day over and over again. Okay, so Reservoir Dogs is the first movie by Quentin Tarantino, who, over the years, has become one of the great American directors and maybe one of the greatest film directors of all time. The scene opens with Quentin Tarantino's character, Mr. Brown, asking all of his table mates, Like a Virgin, asking them if they know what Like a Virgin is about, and he says, you know what, like a version, it's a metaphor for big dicks. And then he goes to explain. He goes on to explain in a very comical fashion how like a version is a metaphor for big dicks. And the reason he says that like a version it is a metaphor for that is because the main the main character of like a version is kind of like this hoary female who meets this su meets this guy who has such a large dick that when he that when she has sex with this guy it hurts her in the way that it did the first time and it makes her feel like a virgin again and. Like, it just, it's the, the movie fades in on Quentin Tarantino giving this ridiculous monologue, and then and that ridiculous monologue sets the scene for you never quite know what the movie is going to be about, and that uncertainty is, sets the entire tone for the movie Reservoir Dogs, because it's told in, like, these flashbacks, 
where they're eating this they're eating this breakfast at this diner because they're about to go rob this diamond joint and as soon as they rob the diamond joint the next time you meet any of these characters you meet them in this warehouse where they were supposed to meet up after the robbery has gone completely awry and you're like wait a minute like 10 minutes ago this dude was talking about big dicks and now all of a sudden they're in this warehouse and somebody's bleeding and everything's gone wrong like what the hell is going on so it's just such a perfect little like doesn't seemingly fit the rest of the movie but it is like the entire quentin tarantino a two-minute monologue that is just it, it, it's it set the stage for his entire career that this is this is what you can expect from this guy and it's we've loved every second of it all right so yeah um god i i really hope the audio holds up with the way the internet is going but um so far um what we're getting it done all right so um yeah so my choice uh by my favorite movie is uh the comedy groundhog day where bill murray's character phil connor's is this kind of cantankerous misanthropic weatherman who's uh forced to relive the same day over and over again and uh you know he kind of grows as a person throughout the course of the movie after you know kind of at first being uh you know perplexed and angry at his situation um but there there's this scene um like because part of his storyline in the movie is that you know he's uh warming up to this producer uh, pl uh rita played by andy mcdowell who is kind of personality wise really his opposite and at first he's kind of finds her grating just because she's so optimistic and silly and whatever uh, but eventually he kind of learns to appreciate her and so uh there's a scene when he's still like in the point where he's kind of figured out how to live over and over again but he still hasn't really accepted it um where he's trying to convince her that he is uh, living the same day over and over again. And so they're in this cafe and uh, he starts going around to these different people in the cafe and telling these little uh, tidbits about their life uh, that he's learned from living the same day over and over again. And uh, Rita's still kind of in disbelief like what are you doing this is some kind of a trick and, and he's just giving these little nuggets about like how oh the you know this this person's getting married but they're having second thoughts or this person snorts like a chipmunk when they laugh or you know somebody's about to drop a, a tray in the kitchen and whatever and it just keeps getting more and more incredulous and it's the kind of thing where it's like if you, if you didn't write that scene really well it would be really stupid and ridiculous but it's written so well and the lines are delivered so well by you know especially by bill murray but also by the entire supporting cast that it really sells you of this guy who's just been in this place long enough to really get to know all these people and everyone's kind of confused by what's going on but they're like you know these kind of naive small town people so they don't like question it too much and and it's just a really delightful distillation of kind of the the, the midpoint of this journey that this guy is on and what the uh situation of this movie is i have to admit i have not seen groundhog day so i cannot really argue against that piece of dialogue so Ben definitely has the advantage here because he has seen Reservoir Dogs and I have not seen Groundhog Day and I can't really criticize that other than that sounds like it might be a little bit hokey, but I can't really criticize it for being hokey when I haven't watched the movie. So what what, what, are, what are your criticisms of mine? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't have a lot because I think Reservoir Dogs is a really well-written movie. Like, as far as that scene of dialogue, I feel, I feel like that's probably the type of thing that, like, you would appreciate more upon rewatching the movie because I've only seen it once. So like I just from seeing it once, like it sets the scene well, but I don't find it as memorable as some of the later interactions in the movie. But I feel like it's the kind of thing where you'd have to maybe see it more than once to fully appreciate it. But I don't really have any knocks on it as far as it not being good. It's more just that um, like I, I haven't like i know you've seen reservoir dogs multiple times and i haven't so 
uh, I don't have as clear recollection of that opening scene as you do. So yeah, I mean, it's, I guess we, neither of us has the best counter arguments, but, uh, they're so both I, good. I they're both good choices. This is kind of, so I guess Jason, maybe like your decision is more like whose opening argument was better. Right. Yeah. Because that's and, pretty much all we have to go off of. Yeah. And Ooh, I'm, uh, a, af, after Jason judges this, I'm going to answer on my phone. Cause maybe the audio will be better on my phone. Cause I'm getting a little bit of, okay. I, I don't think it will strain your internet as much. Yeah. Because, like, my internet is fine, but I don't have it set up to where I can host, I have paid for and can host the multi-call. Yeah, all right. All right, so Jason, give your statement, then we'll take a pause, and then I'll answer on my on my phone. Right. So, you both had very good opening statements. I have seen Groundhog's Day. I haven't seen Reservoir Dogs. Uh, I'm going to try not to let that influence my decision here. Um, but, uh, Zach, I really think you hammered home kind of the comic nature of the opening and also how it fits well with the director's style. Ben, I really like how you talked about how the, um, the dialogue interacts with the character and the overall arc of the movie. Um, and how, how, how it interacts with kind of the, the MacGuffin of the film. So this one was a tough call, uh, but I'm going to give this one to Ben. All right. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think, yeah, I could have even stated that a little bit better of like how it really shows that even though he's still like, doesn't like the situation he's in, he's kind of growing to appreciate these people around him just by the fact that he knows so much about them. But yeah. Well, uh, that concludes round one. So now we're resetting for round two. Um, so actually, uh, so Jason has a prompt related to Twitter that he has a good answer for, and Zach has also thought of an answer, so they will debate and I will be the judge. So the prompt which uh, I came up with uh, was, what is the biggest problem facing Twitter? Uh, my answer is the difficulty of managing and responding as a platform to uh, hate mobs that attack uh, public or semi-public figures. And my answer is how easy it is for your old tweets to be taken out of context. Okay. Or, or, so, or how easy it is for people to dig up your old tweets and purposefully take them out of context. Okay. So, the genius of Twitter as a platform, which is genuinely different than all other platforms, is that it allows the powerful and the influential, the same space as your every average everyday person. You can respond to celebrities, to experts, to public figures in ways that other platforms do not as easily facilitate. If you send a Facebook message to someone famous, uh, they're probably not even going to see it. Uh, if if they, you send them a tweet and there's just a handful of people involved in the conversation, they might see it. In, in, and not only are they going to see it, but everyone else is going to see it. It is, it is a form of networking in public that allows a, a transparency and access that other platforms simply don't. And that facilitates conversations on a wide variety of topics. Unfortunately, the biggest problem facing Twitter is when you have someone who does or says something that is controversial or at least controversial to a certain group of people. Um, what, however small that group of people might seem in society um, based upon their numbers, there's a ton of them online. <laughs> and if, if people are mad at you and think that you've done something wrong, the amount of hatred and vitriol that will be unleashed your way, even if what you did was deserving of, of a slap on the wrist, will be so overwhelming and devastating as to I mean, not only harm your mental health, but potentially place your job at risk, or even damage the people who, 
who are close to you. Um, if they, if the uh, hate mob decides to branch out, as they often do and attack um, others, simply then the the, 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 the seeming wrongdoer. Uh, one of the best example, best one of the most instructive examples of this. Uh, there was a public relations uh, professional who had a tweet uh, that she sent out saying, going to Africa, uh, I hope I don't get AIDS, don't worry, I'm white. Uh, the joke being white people don't get AIDS. Um, and that was a kind of like off-color joke that resonated well with her friends, which was her intended audience, but it was seen by everyone seen as incredibly racist and offensive. And she got on that plane. By the time she landed and had internet access again, she became the most trending uh, topic on Twitter. And she had lost her job because people were so over-the-top just angry at her for saying something they thought was offensive or racist and and that is a story we've seen repeated over and over and over again um you know it's any celebrity that does anything controversial or that is controversial to someone on the platform has to deal with not just harassment i think people of a certain age are used to dealing with harassment online uh Certainly, anyone who operates a YouTube channel that gains any traction, um, or you know, people kind of get used to mean comments or criticisms. But when there's a gigantic deluge of criticisms, sometimes which might be warranted, or that there might be a kernel of truth in them, as a platform, how do you respond to that? I mean, do you do you turn off replies if someone gets more than a thousand? Um, hateful messages a day, or do they um, do they actually block it if you have you know mean sounding words in your tweet? It it is a problem that strikes so clearly at the core of what Twitter is that solving it is is, is a very difficult task compared to uh, any of the other problems that that, that face the platform. So harassment is bad, but mass harassment as an organized movement in order to punish someone, that is a much different beast and a much harder one to, to, to manage. Well, and part of the problem with, I'll, I'll just answer, say this before I get into mine, part of the problem with the Twitter mobs when they start is that like some percentage of the people are actually angry and then when it really spirals out of control is when you get a large percentage of people that start virtue signaling and want everyone want to like show their outrage because I want everyone to think I'm woke and I think she's being racist and she should lose her job and if you make one joke in poor taste in public you should never be forgiven for that uh, and, you know, part of the reason those mobs get out of control is because you have a lot of people that want to try to try to virtue signal by saying, oh, what that person did is bad, and I want everyone to think I'm a good person because I think they're a bad person. Now, my issue, and why I think this is one of the biggest issues that Twitter faces, is it's not just an issue that Twitter faces, is a, it's not necessarily an issue that Twitter faces as a platform, it's an issue that users of Twitter face, and if it could scare future users away from the platform, and if Twitter loses their user base because people are scared of this thing, then Twitter just falls apart. So the, my issue is your old tweets on Twitter, unless you have the wherewithal to go back and delete them, and even then people can dig up old tweets that you have deleted, when you're like 18 or 19 or maybe even like 13 or 14, you're not always going to say the smartest things on the internet. And, you know, because we grow and we mature and we become different people. But those tweets that you tweeted in 2012 when you're just trying to be shockingly funny and trying to be a little bit of an edgelord, if some person 
digs up those tweets because they want to show that, oh, hey, you're a terrible human being. And, you know, what you said seven years ago is what you think now, and everyone should be mad at you, and you should lose your job, and yada, yada, yada. Like, that is just terrible, that you can mistakenly say one thing in, like, one tweet and not even think about it, or you can say one thing in one tweet before you're famous at all and when you're kind of an immature little punky kid, and then six or seven years later... That is up all over the place, and it may cost you your job. It could, If you're an athlete, it could cost you endorsement. It could get you released. There have been multiple examples of this in the last year. James Gunn got fired from Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 for a couple of years because Mike Chernovich, who is a known Twitter troll, dug up some old tweets of James Gunn from 2012 when he was, he was, being, he was being a douchebag, but... The context of the tweets were that he was just being an edgelord and he was trying to shock people and he was going for shock comedy. And Disney already knew about these tweets and they had already signed off on the fact that, okay, you're a different person. You were just kind of an immature idiot back then. But Mike Chernovich, who actually is a terrible person, dug up these tweets, caused a huge faux internet outrage around them, virtue signals about how upset they made him feel, and they got James Gunn fired from Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Yeah, he got his job back eventually, but it cost Disney a lot of money, and it co- it almost cost James Gunn his entire career that one person decided with malicious intent to dig up things that they had said in the past and use them against them. And, like, Dante DiVincenzo, who is a player at Villanova, like, right after he won the MOP of the Final Four in 2018... People dug up old dumb things that he had said in high school when he was kind of just some punky kid who didn't really know any better. People did the the same thing happened to Josh Hader. So if people are scared away from Twitter because they start to realize that, oh man, the dumb things we said when we were teenage idiots who didn't know our our, our heads, our, 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 our sphincters from our elbows are going to be held against us when we actually are like, in our mid-20s and professionals, they're just never going to start using Twitter. So I think that is actually a bigger problem because if you have a problem that scares away the user base, then Twitter is the user base. And if people are too scared to use it and people just start fading away from it because of this, then Twitter falls apart. And to, to, to speak of Jason's thing, just really quick, the... I would like to reiterate that part of the reason those mobs get so out of control is because you have the people who just join onto them uh, because they want to feel good about shaming somebody who's doing something bad. And the example Justin's talking about, or not Justin, Jason is talking about, is a woman named Justine Sacco, who was a PR executive who was going to Africa and who made a dumb off color joke about AIDS. And like one person saw that and tweeted it to somebody else, and, like, John Ronson, and so you've been publicly shamed, goes through the chain of, like, how it went out to her Twitter followers, then someone with, like, 20,000 or so Twitter followers saw that and decided, oh, hey, I'm going to start internet outrage about this, and then it just kind of spiraled. So for, for a hate mob to be started on Twitter, you have to have at least one or two bad actors that either de- that deliberately takes something out of context and, like, kick up the outrage. So I think it is a little bit harder for the mobs to get started, even though the mobs are a lot scarier when they do get started. I think just this idea that everything you have ever tweeted is on display for the world and you have to constantly monitor everything that you say, which defeats the purpose of using Twitter in the first place, is it's just kind of like 280 characters. This what's on my mind right now. If you have to use so much mental energy to censor everything that you type, <laughs> then that defeats the purpose of the platform. Okay. So, uh, Zach, because I want to use his name in, in my arguments, the guy from Guardians of the Galaxy was, was what was his name? James Gunn. James Gunn, okay. Uh, so, Zach makes lots of really good points. Um one weakness in his argument is that um, the old tweets 
you know, that get dug up really are a learning opportunity for society. Now, unfortunately, much of society doesn't take the opportunity to learn that lesson. But we as a society need to learn and accept that we grow and become more aware of issues in the world, um, particularly sensitive issues, as we get older, um, whether that's mental health or, you know, for many people over the past 20 years, LGBT issues. Um, there are lots of old tweets from people uh, where they say things that are homophobic or transphobic. And part of living in a progressive society is understanding that people can change for the better, and when they do, we should accept them for, it, for that. Um, and I, I hope that the, the, the old tweets and the criticisms that they bring can make us better as a society rather than just a liability for those who um, are criticized for the things that they said a long time ago. Now, I realize that we live in a very polarized world where people, where there are bad actors who are trying to stir things up and, you know, anger sells or anger brings people to click on blog posts and online articles and um, much of our worldview is kind of seen as us against them. But we really need to build a world that isn't an us against them, that isn't built on rage and built on anger. Um, you know, hopefully we see some of ourselves in these people who are um, criticized for things they had previously said. The, the, the problem with James Gunn and others who get in trouble for old tweets is the mob. If it was just, hey, this is an old tweet that, that, that exists, um, and here's why it's wrong, then we're having an academic discussion. But as soon as you have these just massive waves of angry or seemingly angry or trollish people who are using that old tweet to hurt someone, that is what causes companies to say, like, oh, we can't have you working for us. That's the backlash that the old tweets bring about. Now, I realize we're kind of arguing two sides of the same coin, um, but the problem of having old tweets is something that is entirely within your control. You can go into your back catalog at any time, presuming you haven't forgotten your password, and decide, hey, I don't want this on my account. Um, but when it comes to hate mobs, they often come at things that you didn't think were even problems in the first place. Yeah, I, I really do think the biggest problem facing Twitter isn't harassment or um, things taken out of context, but just the, amount, the, the volume and speed with which an organized movement can try to destroy someone. But for for those organized movements do to try to destroy someone, you have to dig up the old tweet to deliberately take it out of context to get the movement started. So yeah, it is kind of two sides of the same coin, but the old tweet or the just tweet you're not thinking about because you're just trying to make a joke, like those tweets lead to the mobs, whereas the mobs don't happen all the time over just they, they don't happen all of the time, whereas, like, you can, every single day, every time you tweet, if you know that the outcome of you just tweeting some dumb thing, not thinking about it, might be that you start this huge mob or that you lose your job, then you're not going to want to use the platform. And th that's why I think it is a bigger problem that is facing Twitter, the platform, is that the, the, that this stuff happens to people will make future people just decide that that social media isn't worth it. And if people decide that using the platform isn't worth it because of what will happen to people, because of their old tweets getting dug up, then the company dies. So I think if we're going solely on what is the biggest problem that faces Twitter, the company, that would be 
a re- that would be depressed user numbers caused by these old tweets being dug up and harming people so dramatically. So uh, the only point that I would add that I haven't made yet is that sometimes the hate mobs stem from things that were said or done outside of the platform of, of Twitter. Uh, if people disagree with um, an editorial that someone wrote or something that they said in a YouTube video or um, uh, a dispute that, that arose um, within uh, you know, the context of their marriage, uh, the hate mobs don't have to come from what was originally said on Twitter. It's just that Twitter is where they end up, although often uh, they can arise on Twitter as well. Okay, I, I, I don't have anything else, so... Okay. What, what, what is your ruling? Um, boy, that, that, w- that was a really close argument, because you're, like, you're right, Jason, like, it is kind of two sides of the same coin, like, um, as far as, like, oh, is, is it worse the, the mobs that form, or the people who dig shit up to start these mobs, and, yeah, I think, I think it was a real close back and forth, because, like, Zach, you had some really good examples, um, that you knew really well, and, and Jason, you had some uh, good points that you brought up about um, the how these mobs can affect anyone. But I, I think the thing you said at the end actually like tipped me in your favor of the fact that like it can be something that didn't happen on Twitter that gets moved to Twitter. Um, that that really kind of separates your thing because it's like yeah, I think there is a lot of the uh uh you know i think most of the time it is like something on twitter being stirred up into a mob but like yeah a lot of times you're right it is something that 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 comes from outside uh twitter and gains traction on that site because of the unique uh uh, ability for large groups to coalesce quickly around a topic so that 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 just barely swayed me to your side jason but it was like 5149. That was a really close argument. <laughs> yeah, Zach, you did a very good job on your arguments. Yeah. But if people stop using Twitter, then Twitter won't be a thing. I'm sorry, but eh, I, 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 eh, eh. Yeah, I, I think that I'm, that I'm was like a good it. argument, and I think Jason maybe should have addressed that a little more, but I, I don't, I, I didn't see enough as to why, like, your thing would make people stop using Twitter and Jason's wouldn't, so. Because if, if you have to put so much cognitive effort into every tweet that you write, it defeats the purpose of a quick little social, me- social media where you just type what's on your mind. Yeah. All right. Also, if you know that Twitter is a spot where you can get the hate mobs flooding into you, regardless of what you say on the platform, um, you know, that, that, that's another vulnerability um, as well. Yeah. All right. Basically, so social media sucks and we should just get rid of it. <laughs> Yes, right. Especially now. That I mean, we actually, we actually really should because, yeah. like, social media is just damaging. Uh, like, it, it, there, 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 are, there are very few positive effects of social media, and they that are vastly, vastly outweighed by the negative ones. Well, yeah, I, I think it really depends on a lot of factors, but I, I think it's the type of thing where, like, you you can curate a very good social media experience, but once you start getting too personally invested in social media, then it's probably going to bite you in the ass. But I don't know. I I, th- I think it, I think it is still more good than bad, but I by a, a fairly long shot. But I think it's it's the type of thing that can be destructive if you if you place too much importance on it, and the people who are most vulnerable, like teenagers, especially, often do. Um, no. I, I, I would say that there are reliable sources of information on social media platforms, whether those are the people who you know who have good media literacy, or whether those are you know professional, reliable sources of information, and that social media can be used in very productive, healthy ways uh, to to. Uh, to facilitate communication, um, share photos, uh, maintain relationships, um, uh, share ideas. But it can also be used to, you know, promote cyberbullying and misinformation and um, 
hatred and bigotry and all sorts of other things. And it really is an incredibly powerful tool that I think anyone raising a kid today has to teach them how to effectively use those platforms or if, if they choose to do so. I and mean, even if the kid ultimately decides I don't want to use the platforms, they need to know how they work and what the challenges are for people who do use them. Yeah. Definitely. For those of you struggling to keep track, today is Wednesday. This has been a public service announcement brought to you by the Lawrence Police Department. Wash your hands. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah, I, I like that there was also some uh, police department in Colorado that tweeted, uh, we, we ask that you suspend all uh, criminal activity during this time. We will update you when it is once again safe to return to your criminal enterprises. <laughs> But yeah, like it, it, I, I totally get that. Like I, I'm still keeping track of what day it is, but like I'm a little bit, like the weeks, like this week and last week have kind of run together. So I'm like, wait, is there one week left of the month or two? I don't remember. The Senate passed the coronavirus rescue bill, so then whatever I was talking about was obviously old news. Okay, good. On yeah. Unanimous vote. Unanimous vote. Wow. Wow. Nice. Oh, wow. Let's see what's in it. Yeah. Well, yeah, it, it has been kind of, like, nice to see that, like, even though there's still a lot of bickering that, like, oh, when things are, like, as desperate as, like, can possibly be, like, yeah, they, they, they still will, like, you know, work together to get something done quickly. <laughs> it's just, like, if there is... If there is any room to argue, they will. But if there's none, then they'll get something done. <laughs> okay. So since I won the last round, I will pick the next prompt. All right. Um, if the U.S. were to choose to honor someone new by having them appear on U.S. currency, who would be the best choice? So, so the only criteria here... Uh, is that it can't be someone who's currently on money or has been on money in the past. It has to be someone new to be honored that thus far has not been. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see. I th I mean, I, I know there's already a movement to put Harriet Tubman on the $20 bill over Andrew Jackson, so I would just say they're right. That's that's a good <laughs> that That's a really good choice. All right, I'm going to throw a complete curveball here. Okay. Hank Aaron. Okay, okay. I, I like it. it. Nice. Okay. Now I guess Ben will have you go first. All right, so, uh, yeah, Harriet Tubman, uh, like I said, there's there's already been a movement to, to put her on the $20 bill um, over uh, Andrew Jackson, um, and I think, like, that that is a really good choice um you know because it both provides you know some much needed representation that we currently don't have um uh both for african americans and women but also because she was like a, just a really fascinating figure who is kind of emblematic of um a lot of the struggles that america has gone through and a lot of the uh, resilience that, that has helped us carry through our challenges as a nation. Um, you know, cause like she's kind of a name that we sort of remember hearing about in school, but like maybe don't know a ton about, but, um, like when you think about what she did, the fact that she, uh, you know, was an escaped slave who made these, uh, trips back into the south to help other slaves escape and also um you know formed this network of uh people to help uh escape slaves and uh that she was also uh, during the Mil american civil war that she served as a spy for the union army um and that she was an activist for women's suffrage like uh, the, the you know start and starting out as um, someone born into slavery and like accomplishing all that like it, it's it's a really in, 
it, it's really incredible what she did, and I think it's it's really emblematic of of a lot of the uh, struggles of this country and the resilience of the of the people that um, of this country, especially the people that uh, would be gaining additional representation by having her on currency. Okay, so I agree that Andrew Jackson, arguably the worst president we have had in the history of this country, does not deserve to be on the $20 bill. He doesn't deserve to be on any money. He deserves to be relegated to the dustbin of history because he was he was arguably the worst president we have ever had for just how borderline tyrannical some of the things that he did in office were, including the Trail of Tears and his just ruinous fight with the U.S. Bank. Bank. So my pick would also take worst president of all time, Andrew Jackson, off the $20 bill. And I would replace him with Hank Aaron, the baseball player. And the reason I would replace him with Hank Aaron, the baseball player, is because Hank Aaron would be a perfect symbol of the struggles of the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Because it did not matter that Hank Aaron was the best player in Major League Baseball. He played his entire career for a team located in the South. And when he broke when he broke Babe Ruth's home run record, when he was getting close to it, he got thousands and thousands and thousands of hate mail letters every day. But it didn't matter. He still showed up. He still played every day. He still did his job. He broke the record. He well, he is still recognized by a lot of people as baseball's all time home run king because they think that people still believe that Barry Bonds did or did not was was or was not medically enhanced when he broke the record, but sports figures are really easy to unify around, and I think if, and are really, really notable, because the problem with your pick, the one problem with Harriet Tubman is that people don't remember who she is, and if you, if you're gonna take Andrew Jackson off of the $20 bill, or you're gonna replace Alexander Hamilton on, like, the $10 bill, or if you're going to put anybody on money, it's got to be someone kind of notable. And yes, you said it yourself, Harriet Tubman is a really, really interesting figure, but it's just kind of a name we remember from school. Whereas almost everybody knows who Hank Aaron is, or they at least have a notion of baseball and who, like, the best baseball player of all time was. And sports is a very unifying uh, thing in American culture, and that we often rally around sports to help us get past some of our darkest times and worst disasters, and that's why I think part of the reason why it feels even more weird right now as we're going through the coronavirus pandemic is because after 9-11 and after just other various disasters in the last 20 or 30 years, we've been able to look to sports to distract us and to make us feel good and to like take our mind off of the world around us and it's being, and even sports are being affected by what's going on right now. So I think if you are going to get, if you, I, I agree we should have African-American representation on money in some, in some regard, and that Andrew Jackson should be taken off the $20 bill. I agree with that too. I think Hank Aaron would be a better choice because more people would recognize who he, who he is and were, and I think it would be, slightly, slightly better to represent the struggles of the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s that a lot of the older generation lived through than to represent a, a very important historical figure who most people don't know who it is. Okay, so yeah, I think Hank Aaron is like, is like it would be really cool to see him represented in that way. Um, and like, I mean, I don't have anything negative to say about Hank Aaron, uh, I think he was a great uh, athlete and a great representative of the sport. Um, you know, I, I would question, like, you know, I, I think a lot of people would probably say to put Jackie Robinson on there first because he broke the color barrier in baseball and was also an incredible athlete, even if he doesn't hold the uh, records the way that Hank Aaron does. But the thing about, like, uh, baseball is, like, it's still a very like yes it is still a very relevant cultural force but i think that actually kind of keeps the memory of people like hank aaron uh, alive whereas like i think putting someone on money like harriet tubman like i think that's actually a good way to reintroduce people to this uh 
bit of history um, because, you know, people say like, oh, like this person that I've heard of, like, is significant enough that she's now on this piece of paper in my pocket. Like, I, I should probably be more aware of who she is. And, you know, like, um, just within the last year, we had uh, the movie Harriet, which, uh, you know, kind of revived some interest in her story uh, with Cynthia Erivo getting nominated for uh, Academy Award for Best Actress. Um, so, you know, you do have people, you know, kind of taking a look back and saying like, hey, you know, like we might not have been as interested at the time because like our history textbooks, textbooks were boring. But like if you expose people to the story of Harriet Tubman and find more interesting ways to connect people with that, they'll realize like, oh, wow, this is like a really fascinating figure that we need to take a closer look at. And um, you know, like there, there's other good examples of people from that time period. Like I think Frederick Douglass would also be like someone who really d would deserve some representation in that way. Um, but you know, I, I, I'm picking Harriet Tubman because you, you both recognize someone who, uh, is notable as an African-American abolitionist and as a woman suffragist. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't think like the fact that people may not know her as well is that big a problem and also like you know they, they've you know they've at least heard of who she is and know that she is an admirable historical figure like with hank aaron that's the kind of thing too where people have heard of him and know he's great but you know if you're not a baseball fan you might not have as much of a connection to him either so i think either way like you put someone on um uh, money and that that's just another way to expose people and reintroduce people to the story and i think this the story of harriet tubman is just so evocative of um what our country has been through and what we've had to do to overcome it well the story of hank aaron is also very evocative of what our country has been through and how we've had to overcome it and i think the path to more representation because there should be more representation of other cultures on american money uh the path to more representation is you have to start by having a figure that is widely accepted and i think it will be easier if you put someone like hank aaron on money and people accept the like oh yeah of course he deserves to be on money he was one of the greatest athletes of the 20th century then then once you once you have normalized people to that idea of like oh, hey, there's, there's a black person on the $20 bill, and they just become okay with that, then you can get more stuff like, okay, now we have Harriet Tubman on the... We replaced JFK with Harriet Tubman on the 50 cent piece or something like that. I think you need to go for a figure that will be easier for people to accept right away than for a historical figure that is obscure to a lot of people. Like, it doesn't matter that Andrew Hamilton is on the $10 bill. The only reason he has any cachet in the last couple of years is because of the musical Hamilton. Before that, if you asked, if you showed someone a $10 bill and you asked them, hey, why is Andrew Hamilton famous? What did he do to get on the $10 bill? They said, I didn't even know that was Andrew Hamilton. <laughs> Alexander Hamilton. Okay, the, okay. Yeah, the, story be. the story behind that mistake is when I was last year, one of the teachers I was working with accidentally made that mistake, and I think that just is in my mind and is like a mind virus. Yeah. But most people don't know who Andrew okay. Hamilton is, but most people don't know who Alexander Hamilton is and didn't know before the musical came out. It's okay, Zach, if you had not pointed that out, I would have never caught it. <laughs> yeah. Just, just so you're no, aware. Uh, yeah, but, but, but Ben, no, there's no way Ben would have let that go. That that is true. I mean, I wouldn't have hammered it too hard, but I I would have at least made a joke about it. Um, but yeah, no, I, yeah. I I I don't think people like really need to, um, you know, like I I think of the example of I I don't think people are like you know going to uh, have a negative reaction to putting. Like, yeah, I mean, there's certain people who are just going to react negatively to anything because they're anti-political correctness or they're actually racist. But the majority of the population is going to be okay with any change of this point. 
and I think it's not so much like, you know, like Alexander Hamilton, the thing there is he's been on the $10 bill for so long, it's become passe and people get him confused with Andrew Jackson. They don't remember which one's which, but it's like when you make a change, that's when people really make a notice. Because I remember like when Sacagawea was put on the dollar coin, like that was a big thing because there was also a revived interest in the Lewis and Clark expedition because it was a, like the 200th anniversary. And so you had a lot of people like suddenly being like, okay, like there's a lot of emphasis being put on this on this figure of Sacagawea. Like I... I, I want to learn more about her and then they do and they're like, oh, this is like a really interesting person with a really interesting story and there wasn't any like, oh, like why are they putting her on the $1 coin and 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 the $1 coin, like barely anyone really uses those. They're more of like a novelty thing that you occasionally get um, if you go to the right place or go to the bank or something, whereas like, you know, like a $20 bill or, or something like that, if you, if you made a change that massive, people would really see that so it'd be the kind of thing where it would be a you know a great educational opportunity in schools especially you know that's where these things really make an impression uh, especially um and so I, I don't think the the fact of like you know how relevant someone is to people's lives right now makes that much of a difference and i think the fact that 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 you're making this change will kind of drive that interest that you may not have for someone who has been on a bill for a really long time okay the last the last thing i will say is for the change to be lasting the public has to accept it and i think it would be easier for them to accept and rally around a famous athlete than it would be for them to rally around a largely unknown historical figure uh and i really have nothing else to say other than that because you know it could go really badly and people might hate it and the government might get super cold feet and just change back the next year because we've been known to do that in various instances where we make a change, everybody hates it, and then they go back to the other thing. I don't necessarily know if that's happened with money, but that's happened in a lot of other in a lot of other areas. So I wouldn't necessarily trust that if the initial if the initial public reaction is overwhelmingly negative, that the government wouldn't backtrack and say, okay, we're changing it back. Whereas I think if you have a famous athlete that everybody can rally around, the you're not going to possibly have that really, really negative initial public reaction. Okay. Well, I don't. Yeah, I don't have anything additional to say. That's. I mean, I'm just kind of repeating myself at this point. So. Uh. Sure. So again, like things have been some really fascinating ones to judge because, yeah, you guys did a really good job on that. I'm going to go back to something that Zach said a while ago, uh, which was that in these contests, sometimes you have to play to the judge, or who your judge is will play a huge role in the outcome. Um, so, Zach, you argued really well, but... So I lost then, is what you're saying? Well, yeah, yeah because but I, I picked just the unimpeachable right answer, so I couldn't do anything. <laughs> Like so, I was, I was fucked from the beginning. Then pick the unimpeachable right answer for this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I think, I think your, your, like your point at the end was actually pretty, pretty good there. But yeah, the, the, the I, yeah, I, 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 I probably should have tried to be more creative. Can I, can I finish giving notes? But yeah, go ahead. Okay. So, so the thing, the, the, the difference between Tubman and Hank Aaron is that, like, Harriet Tubman very consciously broke the law and rallied against an unjust system, whereas Hank Aaron was trying to live his life without having the bigotry around him ruin him. And they're both incredibly compelling figures, but personally, I really love the idea of of someone seeing injustice and deciding, no, I'm not going to stand for this. Um, which is exactly why Tubman could, could, could be a much more controversial figure than, than Hank Aaron, um, because, you know, she was on the North side in the Civil War, and there still are a lot of Confederate partisans, um, you know, to this day. Uh, and, in fact, 
the change from uh, Andrew Jackson to Harriet Tubman was delayed by the Trump administration because it was politically unpopular. Zach, your, your argument that Hank Aaron would be someone that a broader coalition of the public could be more comfortable with uh, was very well argued. You also highlighted the difference between, you know, that we want to include an African American, do we want someone from the Civil Rights era, or do we want someone from the Civil War era? And uh, you actually addressed that difference, uh, which uh, Ben didn't do quite as well. Um, but but just 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 how compelling Tubman's life story is, and how much it syncs with the essence of America's story at that very critical time in its history, with themes that still resonate with us today. Uh, yeah, I I really want to see someone like that. On, represented on money, whereas up until now we've had almost exclusively politicians and, you know, largely just presidents. Um, but, yeah, that was, that was a great round. Okay, so this is a good chance for me to but say... I, 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 feel like, I feel like I did a fairly good job arguing against, like, the unimpeachably right answer that time. Yes. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah definitely. Said, it's like, oh, God, I am totally screwed. I'm totally screwed, but yeah, I'm gonna try anyway. Yeah, uh, it was it was a fascinating discussion too. I mean, I I think the the best answer would just be put them both on <laughs> some money. Yeah, yeah, you know, and, and, and the whole idea of me coming up with the prompt is I have to make you choose one over the other. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, obviously, uh, if you could have well, that's great. that that's I I was trying to angle for like, hey, if people accept Hank Aaron on money. Then you can put Harriet Tubman on money, mm -hmm. yeah. because you you can use that as the springboard for hey, our representation on money can be more diverse. Yeah. Whereas if there is such a negative reaction to Harriet Tubman right away, then they might either be so scared they change it back, or that they don't ever do it again. Mm -hmm. Right, which is why if you have a judge that is a bit more risk averse on public opinion, I think they would have chosen you. But because I am so so committed to the idea that you oppose oppression when you see an injustice in the world that like that's what won me over it's particularly in a non-violent way yeah you lost that round not because you argued for me okay I, i'm i'm ready to let the salt flow when i lose again somehow but i i i need to win this round so we can get to the categories i'm actually good at so ben your categories are u.s politics the internet, U.S. history, music and movies, and society. Um, okay, and what category was the last one under? The last one was under U.S. history. Okay, now let's see what you got under society. What is the most annoying thing that people commonly do? <laughs> <laughs> the most annoying thing that people commonly do. So essentially I'm looking for pet peeves here. Not being socially aware, like just 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 general lack of social awareness. And then, if you don't have one, I have one I could argue. Okay, yeah, go ahead. It's gonna take me a while to come to come up with something. So I, I, I have I have something that happened today that I'm gonna go absolutely off on, and it's gonna prove just how unsocial aware people are. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, Jason, what what which one is yours? Okay, so mine is asking people how they're doing without actually wanting to hear a detailed answer. <laughs> okay, so Jason, just to quickly address here, asking people how they're doing without wanting to be a detailed answer is just like being randomly polite and kind, and not necessarily everybody has time for a detailed answer. They're just trying to let you know that they might care about, that, that they care about you enough to ask, even if they don't have time to listen to you. But the most frustrating thing in the world is people who are not socially aware. So today, I was playing disc golf in Centennial Park because the public parks are open right now during the, during the quarantine. And I wanted to go outside and get some exercise because it's a very big park. So even if there are people there, I can very easily socially distance. You know what's really frustrating? When people are not socially aware enough to walk their dog in the park without a leash. Because this dog, these two people, this couple, they had their dog. They were walking up beside me on hole two. I throw my tee shot, like, way out of the way of them. Their dog runs up, picks up my disc, and runs off with it. So they have to go chase down the dog, and then the guy has to throw my
my disc back to me, which somebody else touched my disc. I don't know, that, that, that guy could have had coronavirus. I might have gotten infected with coronavirus. And you know how that could have been avoided? If you have the social awareness to put your dog on a damn leash. And this isn't even the biggest problem with people not having social awareness. Another problem with people not having social awareness is if you're sitting in a hospital office and you're playing a video really loud on your phone and you don't care about anybody else that's in the room. A general lack of social awareness is the most frustrating thing that people do because that general lack of social awareness shows that they don't care about anybody other than themselves, and they show that because they don't take the time to think about anybody other than themselves. So general lack of social awareness is the most annoying thing that people do, 100%. And the general lack of social awareness manifests itself in a bunch of, a bunch of other little annoying things that all stem from that one major problem. Okay. Um... So, uh, Zach, once again, showing his character, uh, characteristic passion. Um, the reason why people asking how you're doing without actually wanting to know a, a detailed answer is so infuriating for me. This used to be something that bothered me a lot. Now it's something that bothers me only a little. But it still nettles me. Because there are times in my life when... Everything seems like it's falling apart, <laughs> either um, in my personal life or in my professional life, or there's some big problem that's going on that's incredibly personal and difficult to deal with. And it is incredibly common, at least in Kansas, where I've lived the predominant amount of my life, in Missouri, where I lived the rest of it, was that people will ask, how are you doing, just as a... Another way of saying, hello, I see you, <laughs> you know, as uh, Zach said, a way of showing that they care enough to ask. But when everything in your life, or it feels like everything in your life, or at least a lot of things in your life, are falling the fuck apart, and you have to tell them things are going fine, or well, or good, when that's not true, just feels horrible. <laughs> And, like, so I, I, I've had uh, one moment where someone asked me how I was doing as they were walking by me and did not stop for whatever my answer was going to be. And as a society, we should be able to figure out some way of saying, hey, I see you, I care about you, I hope you're doing well, without having to ask someone how they're doing without caring what the answer actually is. Like, very, like when things are going very wrong in my life, there's only a handful of people that I trust enough to really get into heavy details about uh, what is going on. And the idea that I have to decide whether or not to disclose that information to people in public, because otherwise I would be lying and the social customary thing to do, the polite thing to do is to just lie, that just seems so inauthentic to me. I don't want a society where we have to have people pretend that things are going fine in their life when they're not. I, and it, 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 it happens, like, it, again, it's just part of the culture. It's just an automatic thing people do. And I wish it wasn't. I wish that when people would ask that when they feel like they're close enough to you that you would be open enough to tell them as opposed to just a customary hi how are you or how are you doing like I care about you just thing it's like no it's like we, we as a society we need to express that sentiment in a way that doesn't put people in situations that feel incredibly uncomfortable um, as for Zach's uh, lack of social awareness uh, answer. Um, not that he has a lack of social awareness. Uh, Zach has more social awareness than I think uh, the vast majority of the population. Um, but you are lumping together a lot of different things, which I guess for the purpose of this prompt will, we can allow. Um, it, that's not one single pet peeve, but that's fine. Um, as for the person walking their dog, I don't think it really has hit a lot of people in Kansas yet, at least in like Lawrence and Manhattan. They've... So obviously if you work in the public schools as that does, like the school year has just been suspended, like that very clearly is a big deal. But for if 
you have an industry other, if you have a job other than that, you might still be, you're probably still going to work. And, or, I mean, if, if you work, obviously, you know, in, in a hospital or something, like, yeah, you clearly realize that you're about to see Armageddon. Um, but it really hasn't hit Kansas in full force yet. I mean, it's going to. I mean, we, we have the first case in Riley County. Uh, the journalism professor got at K-State, believe it or not. Um, but in a week or two, we're going to see it in, in Kansas, and people are going to really feel, you know, the, 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 the crisis in a way that people on the coast are feeling it now. So, I, yes, the, 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 the guy walking his dog should have the social awareness to know that, but it's, it's understandable that not everyone's as plugged in as we are and that, like, this has nothing to do with people being as plugged in as we are. Not having your dog on a leash in a public park is just unjustifiable any time. It has nothing to do with the fact that it is a pandemic right now. It has everything to do with the fact that you are letting your animal run wild and possibly go attack someone, go ruin some, go go ruin like someone's disc golf disc. Disc golf discs are like fifteen to twenty dollars a piece, and they all fly differently, and they're different. And if your dog runs up and ruins someone else's property, a simple, oh, hey, sorry, doesn't cut it. Have your animal on a leash. It is not safe to not have your animal on a leash. Your dog can run out in the middle of traffic. Someone, you're, you're, not having your animal on a leash is dangerous regardless of the situation. That is just the example that I ran into today. Of course, of course. Um, you did make the point about someone touching your desk and wondering if it was infected, so I, I was just addressing that part of, of, of the argument as you made it in the first round. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's bad not having your dog on a leash, but I, I have met dog owners who want parks where their dogs can run around free, and there are dog parks, and I take it that was definitely not a dog park, and uh, it, 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 to me, it's, it's much more understandable than I think it was to you. Um, that doesn't mean that it's okay. It's just that, like, you know, di different people have different things going on in their lives. and uh, Sometimes they don't fully take into account the circumstances around them, even though they should. Um, as for playing a video too loudly on, on their phone, there's a really easy fix, for, you know, as you said, at a doctor's office. There's a really easy fix for that. Hey, could you turn that down? Problem solved. Um, no, the easy, the easy fix for that is having the social awareness to either A, bring headphones, or B, not do that. Even doing that at all shows that you have no social awareness because you are not thinking about anybody else that is in the same room as you at the same time. The only person you are thinking about is yourself. I mean, I, I guess we, we are talking about common things and pet peeves, so we're not talking about larger things. But to me, that just seems so small in the grand scheme of things. Well, yeah. okay, and, and, and in the grand scheme of things, and I, I, I understand why someone asking you how you're doing when you're not doing well really bothers you, Jason, but there are a lot of other yeah. people who actually want people to ask them how they're doing, even if, even if they're feeling bad, because being able to say, hey, you know, I, I'm, I'm fine, just being able to verbalize that will help a lot of people out and will make them feel better and it will show them that oh hey you know it is just common courtesy to ask people how they're doing and if someone takes the time to ask you how they're doing they at least noticed you and they showed you that they they acknowledge the fact that you're there and for a lot of people that is actually incredibly helpful i understand that in your specific case it really really bothers you because i know that I mean, we've known each other for a long time, and I know that if someone asks you how you're doing, you want to give them a really long, detailed answer, but most people don't want to do that. So I think my thing that I am arguing for is is just more of a general problem than a common courtesy that is very that is very bothersome for you, but is totally fine for most other people. So, yeah, I, I, I will admit that this, is, that this is a kind of specific thing to me and to people of similar ways of thinking um but i think just as a society we would just be so much better off if we could just come up with a way to say hey hello i hope you're doing well uh i'm glad i saw you today something you know something to that extent or something better than that 
and when someone can come up with a better answer than that, but but that they convey that same sentiment without putting people in a difficult situation who are dealing with difficult, per, very personal things in their life that they don't want to talk about at that time. Um, so yes, I, I get this is not a problem for everyone, um, but for, for the people who are going through things that are traumatic or difficult or trying in their life, it puts them in a really uncomfortable spot that yeah, again, it's it's not, it's by far, it, this is a minor thing in the grand scheme of things, but I really think that as a society, we ought to have a better way of doing that. Um, so, yeah, Zach, I'm, I, you know, I'm not going to disagree that, like, you've pointed out a problem, but I, I think that the examples that you've given are not as, com but they're very compelling to you, but would not be as compelling to other people, which is exactly the argu argument you made against my point. Um, but it'll be interesting to see what Ben has to say. Well, uh, I yeah. have one more thing to say. I, 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 have, sure. I have more things to say. A lack of social awareness isn't just the person who didn't have their dog on a leash in a park. It isn't just the guy who was playing his phone really loud in the doctor's office while other people were waiting to get were waiting to get looked at the lack of social awareness is just not being aware of how your interactions affect other people and we're seeing this lack of social awareness right now with people who are going out on the beach on spring break and saying like well i don't care i don't care if i get sick i paid for this trip months ago i'm gonna go have fun on the beach people hoarding toilet paper not caring that well, I don't care if an elderly person can't get toilet paper. I need to make sure my family has toilet paper. It's the lack of social awareness and just the overall selfishness of our society affects us every day in almost every way. Because like, if, if, if I was picking one very, very specific thing that bothers me more than anything, it is when people blow their vape on you. And people blow their vape on you because they have no social awareness. And how did smoking get replaced with a hobby that was more annoying? Like, how did that happen? <laughs> because now, now vaping is a lot, at least with smoking, you have to go to a specific area and you understand that what you are doing is bad for you, but you're choosing to do it anyway, and that's fine. But vaping, man, is the worst thing in the world. I was at a Royal Game with Trevor a couple of years ago. Or not, not, last season, last season. First opening, opening series against the Indians. Two really loud people were drunk, really drunk, got cheap tickets to sit near the front, and were really, really loud the whole time, and just didn't care about anybody around them, and this guy pulled out his vape, took a huge suck in on his vape, and blew it right in my face. And I never, I am not an overly confrontational person with people I don't know, because I'm not... I, 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 I choose to be confrontational if I know that, hey, this is a person I can confront. But for most of the time when I'm out in public, I just, you know, I, I, I ignore people. I keep to myself. This dude blew his vape right in my face. I have never wanted to punch somebody more than I did in that one moment because that person did not have the, did not have the social awareness to either blow it in front of him or blow it the other way. No, he blew it right, right on me. Didn't even look, just like, oh, I'm just going to blow my vape wherever I want to blow my vape. So a lack of social awareness, it manifests itself in everything. Everything. And I don't know how we've gotten to the point where our society is so socially unaware, but it bothers me to my core every day, every time I see this. And it bothers me to my core that when you do things that are socially aware... People congratulate you like you've won a fucking medal. It's like, no, I'm just not being a dick. Don't clap for me not being a dick. That should be expected. I am now done. All right. Okay, so I, I, I'm going to make a couple counter arguments because Zach brought up some interesting points in, in his closing. Um, I will try to make them quick. As for the, the partiers on the beach and... Uh, the points that Zach made about uh, the coronavirus and people not taking it seriously. That is a huge problem. I think that is primarily due to the fact that 
certainly spring breakers, uh, you know, college age and below, uh, have not lived through another global pandemic. They've lived through a million false scares about things that turned out not to be nearly as dangerous as the media said they were, and that what they were doing was a problem, but it was at a problem just when a critical mass of the country was beginning to take it seriously, and it made them look really bad, and it was legitimately bad, but I think you have to give them the uh, not, not even the benefit of the doubt, but just the, the courtesy of understanding that, like, we, we never really did mass public education about what to do in a pandemic in the way that we really needed to, and we really are underprepared for this. And I don't think you can blame that on the spring breakers, even if uh, they were a bit immature and annoying uh, and very irresponsible, but irresponsible because they didn't know better. Um uh, the, the vaping thing, yeah, that's that's bad. I don't think people who do that necessarily have ill intent. Um, some of them might. Uh, I think they might think it's a funny prank or joke. Uh, it clearly isn't. Um, that's bad. I don't think that the larger displays of social unawareness, any of which examples you've given out, are quite as annoying as that. Um, and with that, I am done. Okay. All right. So, yeah, this is an interesting uh, argument, of course. Uh, yeah, I mean, both the things you guys picked are things that annoy me. Um, <laughs> Zach, I think your pick kind of, like, you did have a little bit of an issue that it was a little bit more of, a, of an overarching personality trait than, like, one specific thing. But I, I still think, like, it's such an obvious choice, and you did a really good job of arguing it. Like, I, I think I have to go with you here, um, you know, because you, you had great passion and a lot of examples of ways that this can prop up in really frustrating examples. Like, uh, Jason, I, I think your example was also a really good analysis of why this thing is more annoying than we give it credit for, and your personal experience uh like highlighting that um like i i think i i bought it like you know you both kind of made the argument that like well this this thing annoys you specifically but may not annoy as other other people uh as much but i, I bought into zach's use of that counter argument more than i did with jason's um you know because like I, I yeah i think jason your thing is very personal and yeah like that that is really shitty especially like with what you you know some of the things that you had to go through there but like yeah i think zach just that the, this was an example of like something where it the the, the lack of social awareness like just leads to so many incredibly frustrating things that affect different people and it was like it was almost like like i said like not specific enough but still you argued it really well so I, i'm giving you the point <laughs> ah i went around the world doesn't know how to respond yeah, well, I figured if, if, if I can't win any other way, I might as well go for the one where I can be as passionate as possible and just really lean into that. <laughs> nothing, nothing else is working, but we, we, we're, we're going we're gonna to go down that road. Yeah. And just, yeah, for me personally, like, the, the lack of social awareness as a personality trait is extremely grating, so I, I totally get it. Uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, I, I do think that, that my problem does apply to people who are also dealing with very traumatic or personal things that they don't want to talk about. So I, I do think it's larger than just me. Mm -hmm. I, I think that the people, the, 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 the number of people that my choice bothers is much smaller compared to those that Dax bothers. Uh, so. Yeah. yeah. Cause, uh, Cause yeah, I think it, it bothers you more like you and a subset of people very acutely but yeah Zax is more yeah. widespread yeah although i mean come on guys it's it, if 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 you want to pick a pet peeve that just affects everyone 
it's it's the fact that people are starting to use whilst whilst or whilst instead of while i mean it's just like it's a crazy hyper correction what are you people doing you sound ridiculous <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, yeah i i, I mean yeah so, 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 yeah that, that 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 is my extremely hyper specific pet peeve uh okay that that doesn't really bother me that much but is i see it happen a lot okay. okay when that thing happened earlier with that dog running and taking my disc like when that dude threw my disc back to me i shot him this glare and said keep your animal on a leash and he just turned around and like walked away it's like i'm not wrong yeah it's like it yeah it's 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 irresponsible to have your dog on a like in public off a leash but yeah especially if it's at a place like that where like people are trying to engage in another activity with things that the dog might interfere with like oh geez that's that's bad like if like if you're off on a trail or somewhere like that there aren't going to be very many other people it's like i'll be more forgiving but if you're like in a very public space like a city street or a busy park like seriously yeah and then don't don't just you know don't just try to shrug it off like it wasn't a big deal it's like no get a fucking leash yeah because what 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 if your dog goes up and attacks like a child or like knocks over a child and that child like hits their head on cement or something i'm not trying to be hyperbolic but there is shit that can go wrong if your dog just runs up to something yeah get a fucking leash exactly and it's yeah like yeah, and it's like it's you know it's like your dog may be the most perfectly wonderful dog, but they can still just do stupid stuff, or people, or or other people's pets, for example, could react badly to it. You know, like you might have another dog who's tries to pick a fight with it, or or it might run out into the street, like you said. Yeah. Like, yeah, there's just so many things that could go wrong. So it's like, yeah, your dog may be a sweet, perfect angel, and it probably is, but like, there's just too many variables that at play that you can't control like you you're better off just being safe and responsible because like you know you could be putting your dog in danger your own dog in danger too exactly and and if 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 that dog does that to a lot more unreasonable person because i know there are a lot more unreasonable people who would say a lot more than just hey keep your animal on a leash then you might get ripped up one side and down on the other by some angry person. And is that really how you want to spend your day? Yeah. Like, because, you know, I know there are a lot of people to play out there because I've watched them who would probably blow their stack at that. And it's like, you're lucky that I just snarkily yelled something at you and that was the end of that. <sighs> okay. So, Jason, what, 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 yes, what, 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 what dust we have? U.S. politics, the internet, U.S. history, music and movies, and society. I'll try U.S. history again, even though it burned me last time. What is the worst single piece of legislation approved by Congress? The worst single piece of legislation approved by Congress. So this is, you know, founding through today. Mm, that would be a good answer, but I don't. I don't have any. Don't have any way to argue for it because I don't know enough about it. Well, the Fugitive Slave Act. All right. Um, the God. Yeah, that is a really good one. I. I was going to say the Indian Removal Act. <laughs> so you're going to Indian Removal. See, yeah. I was going to say Alien and Sedition Act, but the problem is I don't know enough about them to argue for them. Right. Yeah. Okay, so I think the reason that the Fugitive Slave Act was the worst piece of legislation that ever passed Congress is because the Fugitive Slave Act made it mandatory for escaped slaves to be returned to their southern owners, which just further inflamed tensions before the Civil War, and it, it was one of the many things in the spiral that brought about the war as quickly as it did. Uh, because before they had passed the Fugitive Slave Act, slaves were able to get their freedom by, by escaping from the South and going to the North. And the Fugitive Slave Act made it to where if you caught a slave in the North, you had to return them to their Southern owner. And it caused, instead of fixing a, instead of fixing a problem of uh, returning slaves to their owners, it made the problem a hundred times worse. 
So because of that, and because it's just so unbelievably racist, and you had you would have people who would end up getting captured and shipped to the South as fugitive slaves just on total bogus. So just for how unbelievably racist it was and how unbelievably, like, on a, well, it hard, would be hard to say that it's un-American <laughs> because that, that it, 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 was, it, it, was, it was the America of the time, but how unbelievably racist it is and just how, when you look at that now, it, it's one of the times where you just scratch your head saying, we actually let that happen as a country? Do we actually, like, mean... It, d- do, does our constitution mean anything? Do do we do we stand? Do we practice what we preach? Of course we don't, and we never have. And the Fugitive Slave Act is the prime example of that. And it is just so head scratchingly bad. It's one of those times where you just sit back and say, "Am I really proud to be a U.S. citizen?" Yeah. Well. Yeah. Uh, so now I'm going to argue why the Fugitive Slave Act wasn't that bad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, the, yeah, that was definitely a horrible thing. Um, and yeah, there's there's not really anything I can uh, say to counter that. Um, the Indian Removal Act, however, was also a horrible thing that uh, America did. In the Fugitive Slave Act was uh, like 1850, and uh, Indian Removal Act was 1830. Um, I, I, I actually just searched that on Wikipedia just to double check, but, uh, so the Indian Removal Act, uh, was like, um, yeah, so that was during the Jackson, Andrew Jackson administration, um, and we've already extolled his virtues on this episode, um, so, you know, I was basically saying, like, these Native American tribes from, uh, the Southeast are going to be um, f- relocated from their ancestral lands to um, Indian territory, which was mostly the state of Oklahoma, what is now the state of Oklahoma, and put on these reservations. And so, um, you know, what what you had there is you had the removal of tens of thousands of Native Americans and uh, over, like it says, here it was like maybe like I, th- I think like st- about sixty thousand Native Americans and like over ten thousand of them died <laughs> or something like that. Uh, and during the Trail of Tears, um, so you you had um, the fact that this is affecting these entire groups of people, forcing them to move from their uh, homelands, putting them in, in this new area that they were unprepared to live in and didn't have the resources to live in and, and subjecting them to this gruel, grueling march across this large portion of the country with no resources and harsh conditions. And, um, you know, in, in both these cases, like the both the Native Americans and the fugitive slaves were... Uh, regarded as less than fully human by the United States government in enacting this legislation. Um, and I think the fact that this had such a lasting impact in, in, in decimating these tribes and, um, you know, totally changing their way of life, like it just had such a massive impact. And I think the, you know, obviously the fugitive slave act was a a horrible thing as well um but you know it was something that was uh you know kind of making a bad situation already worse whereas like the indian removal act was taking something and creating this whole huge uh kind of you know almost genocidal situation uh where there didn't even have to, like you know there 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 was no reason to do it other than the fact that people didn't believe the indians were uh worthy of their basic human rights well yes 
in, they, they didn't believe Indians were worthy of the basic human rights, but they all they but what what drove both of our terrible pieces of legislation here is just the idea of the group being attacked was not worthy of their basic human rights. Yeah, I think what makes the fugitive slave act just a little bit worse is that, like you said, you know, slavery was already really well ingrained. But the Fugitive Slave Act showed was the fi- one of the final straws showing just how far the South was willing to go to protect slavery, and it really like pushed it pushed us all the way to the edge in terms of okay, now not only are you not only are you refusing to give up slavery, but if a slave escapes, you are going to shackle them and return them to their owner. And you're going to use this piece of legislation as an excuse to just round up random black people that looks like that look like they might have been somebody slave at some point and ship them back to the South too. So because of that and because of just how indiscriminate some of the kidnappings were, where you have stories like a Solomon Northrop or someone like that who got just randomly rounded up and shipped to the South, where I think he might have been pre-Fugitive Slave Act, but the Fugitive Slave Act made it even easier for you to do that. So I think just the idea that you are, both of them involved ripping people away from their way of life and moving them somewhere else, but the Indians, this is going to sound terrible, and I'm not trying to defend the Trail of Tears as being in like it justifiable in any way, but the Indians at least knew where they were going and they knew that okay, we're going to be put somewhere else where we were trying to make a new life for our, a life for ourselves. Whereas slaves were being sent back to certain torture and a very likely death. So I think just how much harsher the conditions you were going to if you were sent back into slavery makes it a little bit worse. Even though the scale of the the scale of Indian removal is very large and terrible and it is one of the blackest marks in american history i do not dispute that yeah um yeah i i I don't have much additional to add because yeah i think it is kind of like you said kind of a like yeah i I agree that the conditions of being enslaved are worse than the conditions of being stuck on a indian reservation even if the process of getting there was absolutely horrible i yeah i think yeah where my argument lies is just the the scale of suffering that was caused and the way it basically uh you know took these groups of people and you know decimated not just individuals but these entire uh social groups of these indian tribes and decimated their populations and their way way of life so yeah they're they're both really awful horrible marks on american history all right jason what do you got wow okay um very well argued uh and i i like producing this kind of history content which you know has has been pointed out in his argument for tubman you know it's important to let people know about the the struggles of, of american history but yeah, it's a tough choice. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's depressing just to think about. <laughs> yeah. And Ben, if, if, if you had gotten the Fugitive Playbacks before me, I, I probably would have said the Trail of Tears just because I think these two are like two obvious ones that are just like, wow, we actually did that. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. So I, I'm going to give this one to Ben. Because, because it was borderline genocidal, and it, it really did decimate entire cultures and communities. And Zach, you argued really well. Um, I, I mean, I, I think if you would have been a bit more explicit about, like, you know, this led to the Civil War, and the Civil War had so many deaths, and but, but even then. Uh, Ben, you, you could have hammered home a bit more that like this was part of a larger American genocide. This was setting uh, the table for you know the, the the future mistreatment of the Indians that would happen even past their removal west of the Mississippi. Um, yeah, I, yeah, you you both did a great job. Yeah, that was tough. Like once once we started talking about like 
especially like bringing up like the part about like the the free black men being kidnapped and sent south i'm like oh god that yeah jesus christ that's so horrible and then and then like yeah genocide oh, yeah. Well, on like, the like, you know like yeah, genocide yeah, on those side they're both so fucking horrible it's like i, I almost kind of lose my appetite to argue further <laughs> yeah that that's your argument that like they got the wrong people sometimes like that that uh, was it's not just that they got the wrong people; they deliberately got the wrong people sometimes. Yeah. yeah. And there, yeah. there, 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 there would just be roundups of like, "Oh, hey, we heard there's an escaped slave here. We're just gonna round up a bunch of black people and hope hope we got the right one, and not really care if we did." Well, fortunately, and the though, Fugitive Slave Act made made that okay. Well, f fortunately, we have completely overcome the effects of both of these things um, because. Um, it's not like, you know, uh, in today's society, uh, police officers indiscriminately harass black people or uh, many Native Americans are stuff, stuck on reservations with crushing poverty and few opportunities. So we fully, you know, <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, th things, things are a lot better, but there's things are a lot better, but there's still lingering effects from both yeah. of these things in modern society that are really bad. I feel like at least on that one, we were arguing on equal footing. It wasn't like that, that money one where it's like, oh man, I'm arguing against the obvious right answer. I just have no chance here. Right. Yeah, the Fugitive Slave Act would have been my first choice as well if I was arguing. But yeah, I don't know what it is when we actually... When we actually prepare, Ben does a lot better than me because he is better at actually preparing. But when we just go off the cuff, like, I do better at that. I, I don't know why. I, I'm just less likely. I'm less likely to repeat myself, and I'm more likely uh, to pick things I know I can argue for well. So what do you think of the prompts so far? I mean, they've been... I, I was worried about that Twitter one until I pulled that one out of my ass at the end. But, uh, I mean, they, they've been they've been pretty good. My, my, my only my only complaint with the money one is just that there was one obvious right answer there and it was gonna be hard for anybody to overcome that because I, I almost said like a, I almost said like Babe Ruth or somebody like that but then it's like but then we, we, we need diversity on money and replacing Andrew Jackson with a famous white athlete isn't giving us any diversity I actually should have said Jim Thorpe uh, whatever and no I, I, I wouldn't have been able to argue for him worth a damn so wouldn't have been what would have been a bad choice. Yeah, you, you could argue for Martin Luther King or uh, Frederick Douglass. Or, I, I mean, they, they would all be very thematically similar to, to, to Tubman. But... Yeah, but but the, 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 the Tubman thing, it, since, it, since that already has traction, it's just so hard to argue against that unless you throw a complete right. curveball. And, like, the, the, the complete curveball was arguing for a sports figure. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so I, I was hearing, like, yeah, as far as the discussion on, like, uh, uh, prepared versus off the cuff, like, yeah, I think when we first started doing prepared ones, like, you were still a lot better than me just because I'm not naturally as good at this as you are. But I think once we did more of them, like, I, I, I improved a bit because, like, I had more exposure to your arguing style so i could think of like i could kind of anticipate what sort of counter arguments i need to be ready for and what sort of points i'd need to have to counter argue uh your uh choices whereas like when we're going off the cuff i have to react to that in real time and it's a lot harder <laughs> uh, okay well all right so I, it, it, all right if, 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 if you pick a prompt, if you pick a prompt that I don't think I can argue for, I, I will take this one off arguing and judge it. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I'm kind of leaning towards for the category, the uh, movies and music one. Okay, well then I, I'll, I'll, I'll probably have to... I think, I think I'll, 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 I'll judge the U.S. politics one whenever we get to that. All right. Okay. But yeah, we, we can do music and movies now. Yeah, I think after that last category, we need something a little uh, more frivolous. Yeah. Okay. What is the worst trend in modern music? 
worst trend in modern music? Hmm. I don't know. Country rap is pretty grating. I don't know if that's a bad trend. That just that annoys me. I, yeah, I don't think that's a bad trend. I think that just annoys me. Yeah. Well. Uh, I don't know. It depends exactly. Like, you know, I, I might have to fudge the definition of trend as to to be a little more broader of like what is just the worst thing uh, that that people do in modern music because it's not really a trend. It's been around forever. Okay. I just think it's getting worse. Pop but... country. Pop country. Okay. Worst trend in modern music, pop country. Okay, well, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll try and think of something that fits more into the trend thing because I, I had some other ideas. But, yeah, I think if I go for... Um, let me let me think if, if there's... Uh, um, um... So, so, Zach, would you... If, 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 the, if the prompt was instead worst aspect of modern music, would you have a different choice? Pop country. There is there is nothing worse in modern music than pop country. Okay. Um. Let's see. I I I'm gonna think if I can think of something that 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 would be a good foil against this specifically, or if I want to go with a more general answer. Um. Okay. Yeah. Fuck it. I I'm I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with my general answer. Consequences be damned. And my 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 more general answer of the thing that annoys me most in modern music is excessive repetition particularly of lyrics okay so the reason why pop country is the worst trend in modern music the worst trend in modern music is pop music is you know generally defined as popular music and country music is usually music that comes out of rural areas that people who live in rural that rural areas can relate to i'm not saying all pop music is bad and i'm not saying all country music is bad when you you can listen to you can listen to some stuff that has like a little bit of a country vibe like you know i've, I've gotten into some more country sounding blues because of ben's influence and that's totally fine and i enjoy that but you know what is the worst most grating thing ever when you mix country lyrics with pop rhythms and pop sounds because it just doesn't fit together and it's like this weird abortion of sound that just pleases no one and you you feel dumber for hearing it and it's just it's not that either one of those things are bad by themselves it's when you put them together you make this abomination of sound that should not be heard by anyone and serves no purpose and makes you dumber for having heard it <laughs> okay well yeah if the I, I'm... Uh, just, just for for example, for example, the song "Red Solo Cup" by Toby Keith, perfect example, or any of those dumb songs about, hey, let's go get some beer in the back of the truck and let's go have a fucking party. It's like, okay, that's fine, but don't make this sound like a pop song. Just like Willie Nelson, this play your guitar, stand at the front of the stage, sing some sad, forlorn lyric about it. Like, just make make it make it obvious which is which. Stay in your damn lane. If it just if, if 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 I'm gonna hear pop music, I have I, I'm expecting to hear like Taylor Swift or something like that. If I'm gonna hear country music, I'm expecting to hear like Johnny Cash or Willie Nelson. I'm not expecting to hear some weird bastardization of both of them that is just awful. Because like yeah, sometimes when you have lyrics that don't necessarily fit the music, that can be kind of interesting. Like you know. But that's usually if you have songs that have kind of dark lyrics with really upbeat poppy music, like Pumped Up Kicks by Foster the People, or or especially the healthy one by Laura Stevenson, which I was listening to last night, and God, that song is even more prescient right now than it, than it ever has been any other time <laughs> I've listened to it. Yeah. But it does not work. When playing, singing country lyrics over overly poppy music just does not work. And, like, just stop. Stop! It's it, it's bad. Just please realize this is bad. I know people are still listening to it, but just just stop stop listening to it, okay? Pop music should stay in its lane, and country music should stay in its lane. Stop doing these terrible crossovers that most people don't want. Okay, so yeah, it this is an interesting choice because like I'm I'm not surprised that you chose this because like a lot of people really hate pop country, even though obviously it's super popular especially in uh, rural areas. Um, 
but it's one of those things that like you'll often see like oh i like all kinds of music except for like country and like either like rap or death metal or some other thing that a lot of people don't like uh but country is like one of the ones that people are uh, the, and they, they usually mean the pop country of like oh this is something i definitely don't like um and, and i will counter argue against that in the middle but in a minute but before i get too bogged down in that um my the thing that really bothers me in popular music is just how goddamn repetitive it is like if like the, one of the things i really like about uh blues music and some of the other types of music i listen to is that like the songs structure wise kind of feel more like a story of like there's a beginning and then there's like some verses and then there's maybe a solo and then there's a resolution both musically and lyrically and it you know it so it kind of flows like you know like like a plot diagram for a movie or a book um whereas like so many pop songs just like uh you know start with maybe a verse or two and then they repeat the chorus over and over and over it's like god damn it i know what the chorus sounds like play something else interest me somehow like i, I get to tune out uh you know and and it and it depends like it could be an awful song like uh truly madly deeply by savage garden where that i want to stand with you on a mountain you know just like gets drilled into your brain and you're like no make it stop or or it could it could be like a really good thing that i would otherwise like if it wasn't so repetitive like for example like adele is one of the best pop singers right now like she has an incredible voice and her music sounds really good and i want to like it but it's just like so repetitive like i i you know like i i think one time i counted how many times she repeats the words rumor has it in the song rumor has it it's like well over 30 times or like someone like you it's like i th that sounds really good but just add something more to it don't don't lash yourself to this this repetitiveness that is demanded of you by pop music break free and make something unique and interesting out of it um now on the other hand like country music uh the this pop country music actually kind of like you know obviously it, it, it is being pop like it, it has more of the repetition in it than i would like although it's not quite as bad as some other styles because country is a little more about telling a story with your lyrics so so it's bad but it's not quite as bad as like straight pop music is um but actually you know i, I kind of have a mixed opinion a mixed to positive opinion on pop country like yes i would much prefer if country was all like willie nelson and johnny cash and like people who are actually like really good but like there's there's some good you know in like i kind of enjoy that vibe like it's you know in the same way i'd enjoy like mcdonald's even though i'd rather have like a burger from a really good burger place like i i can enjoy mcdonald's because it's just you know like the trashy comfort food that you know and i know like you had like uh a, 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 okay as soon as you said the trashy comfort food, I knew I was screwed. <laughs> like, cause my, my, my only argument against you was going to be that the repetition doesn't bother me as much because a lot of my favorite songs are kind of repetitive and the repetition doesn't doesn't bother me as much. <laughs> I, 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 I totally get why that bothers you a lot, but I can't really argue against the trashy comfort food. Because, like, yeah. I really, really hate it and a lot of other people really, really hate it, but, I mean... There, there, are, there are things that are worse, I guess. I, I don't know. Yeah, because there is some pop country, especially the country that gets too pop or that has like the, like the fake rap elements in it. That that really is terrible. But there's there's some that I actually like. You know, like I mean, obviously Taylor Swift grew out of that, and she had some songs that were really good. And there's, you know, there's there's a, the occasional song by like a Tim McGraw or Dierks Bentley or Garth Brooks or whatever, where I'm like, you know, I actually like this pretty well. But then, yeah, there's also a lot of stuff that is pure crap, so it's it's kind of a mixed bag. <laughs> like, yeah, like Red Solo Cup, like, I don't hate the way that song sounds, but it is, like, the most shameless, like, sellout in music history. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. 
the the trashy <laughs> comfort food. Yeah, the McDonald's. Okay, yeah. <laughs> it, it, yeah I, it, I, I it's it's like the it, it's like what the McRib is to actual barbecue. <laughs> it's like I don't really <laughs> like it, but I'll eat it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Chance. What, 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 what were you gonna say as the actual judge in this? I, I was just gonna say that. Uh, I don't really have too much to add that you guys haven't already better said. So, um, when you started out with country rap, I it was a bit worried because, like, well, I actually kind of like some of the fusions that happen between country and, and rap, although they're rare. But then when you made it clear that, no, what I'm talking about is, like, the really poppy uh, uh, country that is just you know, a copy and paste from all of the other songs that are exactly the same way that doesn't really have its own kind of integrity to it. It's like, yeah, no, I hear you. <laughs> um, then I, 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 I think you did a, a, a good job pointing out just like, just how annoying just repetitive lyrics can be and, uh, and just like, ah, oh, come on. <laughs> you know, like, well, yeah, the, I, I, I want to enjoy the song. on how they're using the repetition. Yeah, good point. It, it, it depends on how they're using the repetition. It depends on what is being repeated. Yeah. Like some some of my favorite songs like are they have repetitive lyrics and they don't bother me. But like my biggest problem with the Oasis album "Be Here Now" is that each song is like at least two minutes too long and way too repetitive. So yeah. like it, it it will get to a point where even my favorite artists do that, and I just can't I can't ignore how much it bothers me. So, like, the opening song on Be Here Now is called Do You Know What I Mean? And, like, the first three minutes of that song are absolutely incredible. But then it goes on for four and a half minutes, and it just repeats, Do You Know What I Mean? Right, all my people right here, right now, do you know what I mean? For four fucking minutes, and it's like, do less coke and make a good song. Yeah. This, 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 there were three really, really good minutes in this song, and there are four and a half minutes of hey, we snorted a lot of coke and we just kind of kept playing our instruments. Yeah, because, like, I, there, there are ways you can make repetitive things, like, work if you, like, repeat it, but you slightly change the music behind it as you go to kind of, like, shift the mood within your repetition. Whereas if you're just doing the same thing over and over again without any change, like, that's when it gets really bad. Or, like, when you can tell that the song was put together in a commercially-minded way where it's, like oh, we, like, it was mandated from on high that we had to rep repeat the chorus X number of times, you know, in order to really drill it into people's heads so it would top the charts, whereas it, this song would have been a lot stronger if we'd, like, maybe had half the choruses and twice the verses or something like that. But, yeah, it, yeah. it, it depends. Because, like, yeah, there, there are things where you can make repetition, like, really interesting. Uh, like, if, if you do add some slight variation to it but it's it's those times when you have that repetition and it's just the same like when it's like oh god come on <laughs> oh yeah it's like even even like the healthy one is is slightly repetitive in the way that she says and you will live long you will bury them all in the ground and your body will grow you'll bury them all she repeats that like three times, but every time she says it, she sings it a different way, so it doesn't feel repetitive. Exactly. It's yeah. It's like because in some of those pop songs, you can like sometimes they even just copy and paste like this same take into multiple parts of the song because they want it to sound exactly the same. Whereas like yeah, there, Laura Stevenson, like is just such a master of like uh, getting those subtle uh, bits of feeling out out of her voice so it really does sound unique each time and hits you a different way i mean i still will defend to my dying day that if you cut if you recut be here now by oasis you could make a really really good album because those songs are good like those songs are good other than magic Pie. magic Pie sucks but the rest of those songs are good they're just way too long if, if you stripped out all of the unnecessary stuff and got those songs down to the core of what the song was, then you they would have had a really, really good third album. But it was just overly bloated, and they did way too much coke, and they didn't care. Mm -hmm. And like, oh, we've we, we, we released two amazingly successful and like really good albums in a row. We can do no wrong. It's, 
we, we can we can have a 78 minute album with multiple songs that are seven minutes long and super over bloated it's like no you're not you're not guns and roses you're not going to make that work it's like both both Super illusion albums are really long and guns and roses was known for making really long songs but their really long songs are like like very unique and there is no repetition in them mm-hmm. like coma or a strange or locomotive or November Rain, like, all of these songs that are super, super long, that are, like, interesting, interesting, like, stories that are just told over, like, nine minutes. And there's nothing wrong with long songs. It's long songs that are repetitive that are the problem. It's yeah. like, the, 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 this length has to feel necessary. Like, okay, can you yeah. guess in my favorite so- in my favorite songs bracket that I'm putting together right now, can you guess what the longest song is and how long it is? Uh, well, I know, I know you have, uh, well, I was going to say Money for Nothing, but you just mentioned Coma, and that's over 10 minutes. I don't know what you'd have that would be longer than that. The Adam Hart Mother Suite by Pink Floyd is 26 minutes long. Oh, yeah. Nice. It is the entire, it's the entire front side of the Ad, of Adam Hart Mother, if you buy the record. Yeah. So... But that's like a really interesting 26 minute like just rock odyssey or as like that just feels unique and fascinating and like just takes you through all these amazing ups and downs and like there is nothing wrong with long songs as long as as long as the length feels earned. It's, it's when it's just like, oh, this song should have ended four minutes ago. Why am I still listening to this? That concludes the first part of our quarantine special episode with Zach, Ben, and Jason on our debate podcast. You can catch the second part at zachandben.podomatic.com or at the Blues DJ Ben channel on YouTube. In the second part, we debate more topics related to politics, pop culture, history, and more and also shout out some of the various creators and charities that that we would like to support during the 